Well, welcome everyone to Nano's Indie Cafe podcast, where we interview cool indies and stuff. I have a pretty cool guest with me today, but before we get to it, it has like been a while. But but we'll be back. We should have more podcasts. We might even put the podcast on its own separate YouTube channel. We're still trying to figure that out. But but if you are watching on YouTube, make sure to. You know, like ring that bell, comment. But if you're listening to it on the podcast, make sure to subscribe and like give a rate and you know listen. That helps. So t- today I have the the developer of Evertried, Pedro. Welcome t- to the show. Thanks, Nano. Glad to have you have to have you have me here. I guess. Yeah, and this is episode twelve. Man, I almost forgot the episode number after I just looked it up. But so, tell us a little bit about you. Who are you? Who is Pedro or Pedro? Sure. Yeah, I'll do my best to tell an interesting story, although my life is not that interesting. So, um, well, my name is Pedro, Pedro Comenero. I use a nickname called Myganic uh, with online games and such. I'm 28 years old. I'm the co-founder of Dunic Games, which is an indie game studio based in Santos, Brazil. So I'm Brazilian. And I've been working with games for the past, I guess, eight years. My first job with, with the gaming industry was by working with a very big online game publisher in Latin America called Level Up. I started out there as an intern, testing games and just doing a lot of QA and focus groups and, and reports on games that might come to the Latin American market. Mm-hmm. And after a while, I start moving into the business part of games uh, with sourcing and talking about strategy and trying to bring more content to the Latin America online market. And in 2018, I left Level Up to start my, my actual development career. And since then, I've been working with my, my business partner, Eduardo, which is also the other co-founder of Donate Games. And we have launched a uh, uh, free a free mobile game called Tower Smash for Android, uh, which is available on Google Play. And right now we are working in, with Evertried uh, alongside the Neil Dominguez, which is another development that we are working in partnership with. So, so, so um, Evertried is your second game that you, your company is developing? Right. We could say it's the third game, actually. Okay. There's an interesting story behind that. Uh, the, first, the first title that we actually developed developed together was Tower Smash, which is that, that arcade which play game. But after we launched Tower Smash, we, d- we started developing another 2D platforming game called Lumi and the Dark Nebula, which we didn't finish it yet. Mm. And we went to uh, a local indie scene showcase called Big Festival, which every year between June and, and July, there is a conference in Brazil for the, the indie industry. And mm. some big players actually come and show up like Bandai, and EA, but it's mostly uh, towards the, the indie scene. And we showcased Lumi and the Dark Nebula during the, the conference, but it was on that same conference that we met with Danilo, which was, we could say he was, he had the skeleton, the skeleton, sorry, forgot the, how to say that in English. He has the skeleton for, forever tried at that point. It was like a prototype about okay. uh, a cowboy that moved in a grid floor, and every time he killed all the slimes, he moved to another floor. And he was looking for actually a creative team to do the art, animation, and audio. And we were lo- working with Lumen the Dark Nebula, but we are also looking for a programmer because we had a stronger foot in the creative part, but for the technical things and really have the one that's solely focused on programming was something that was lacking on your team. So when we met and he, he, he showed to us like the at the time, it was called Tile Tower, which we can see is the grandfather of Evertried. We looked at the project and we felt like there's something special here. Maybe there's something here that we can like really move into the next level. So we stopped developing Lumen the Dark Nebula because although we, we love that game to death, like we, we have a mascot and the, we like the, the visuals, but we had to be honest with ourselves that developing a 2D platformer for the market today it's a much bigger challenge than developing uh, something that feels more unique, which ever tried looks more unique being a tactical turn based yeah, yeah, isometric yeah, yeah. roguelike, right? Yeah, if I, I had I, to make a, like another Mario clone, I was screwed. 
<laughs> yeah, but I feel like there's way too like the any scene itself is is very saturated, and, and when when you um when you add two D platformers, it becomes even more saturated. Not to say you shouldn't make a two D platformer. If you want to make a two D platform, go for it. But do realize it's gonna be really hard to stand out like you're gonna have to reinvent the wheel or do something unique that that makes yourself like stand out like you your 2d platformer has to be really really amazing which if you're brand new and it's your first game i, I hate to say it, your first game isn't going to be amazing sure yeah exactly right and we had to be smart at that point like yeah. we could either make a game that we really enjoyed and we felt was like cute and tell told a very good story about what kind of developers we were mm -hmm. or we can try to do the same thing but with something that had more business potential and, and uh, like a, a bigger market yeah. share so of it... course especially when you're you're starting out mm -hmm. with your studio you don't have as as many hits behind you 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 can yeah. if you can avoid making mistakes you have to do that right? yeah it's good to uh start small and uh and do things that work and get your name out there and make your money and then once you build a reputation you, you can go back and do that stuff right right exactly we have the our whole career ahead of us but every every right step that we take now it's going to make it easier for us for the, the next game and of course at some point we're going to finish lumen the dark nebula we just have to pick the the right time for us to to really feel we can uh, we can afford making like taking that challenge of making a 2D platformer, or if we have like a, a brilliant idea of how to bring a, a twist that's so innovative to it, that it would be would be easier for us to bring that to market. But right now we are very happy working with Evertried, and we're planning to 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 finish the game itself by January mm -hmm. of 2021, which means roughly it's going to to be on the market by I believe March or maybe up to May. Because okay. there's localization to take care of, right? Marketing strategy, and there's yeah. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot behind uh, the scenes. The yeah, exactly. And of course, yeah. you, you cannot do everything by yourself at the same time. So first, we have to make sure we have a fun game, and then we have to make sure yeah. that the game can actually survive. Because because we're like in the, we're now in the period of like any games and game development where you can't just make a game and put it out there. Like back in the day, you could do that, but because of how many games there are now, like you have to, you have to market. Even if you don't want to market, you have to do it. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's easier to have a mediocre game with a huge marketing budget and make it appear in the market than have like the biggest, um, the biggest amazing game that no one heard about, right? So there's a, a lot of balance there that you have yeah. to understand. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not, to, and I'm not telling people to make garbage games. I I, I still think sure. you should make a good quality game. You, you know, make right. the game the best you can. But you do also have to like market, and sometimes you have to make compromises and, and find that balance between your passion and a business. Because it's at the end of the day, it's still a business, and you you got you got like get some revenue in your right. account and stuff so right you you were spot on man. Like you have to really understand what's your goal behind each game if you want to make money you have to make the best game that you can that ha delivers the most fun for your tar target audience but you also have to make sure your target audience will actually know yeah. your game exists Ooh. but if you just want to make the game that you want your passion project that Go for it. Just yeah. don't expect. I mean, I, I I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to make my dream game, cause it, it oh, like it. it's way up there, man. Like I, I I'll to tell you about it, like off recording, but like it's okay. like it's very like I would need collaborations with major gaming companies. Like it would require mm -hmm. an amazing budget. So I'm, and I I don't Got know if I'm willing to downscale. So. Okay, okay, yeah. So when you have a cool vision, sometimes, like, you can compromise to a point, but 
when your compromise actually damages your vision, then yeah, yeah leave for another time. Sure. Yes, maybe one day, but it, 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 it will require resources. Though I, I have like concern. Okay, if I, if I can't make it the game I want, maybe I can make it into a web comic or something. I'm, I'm thinking other ways, you know. But right, but, right. Uh, but, but I, I do kind of want to learn more about you. Uh, did, did, did you play a lot of games growing up? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, sometimes people tell like when how old they were but when they started playing games and i don't want to be unfair but so i would just say i can't remember myself without playing games like okay. my my earliest memory i, I was playing uh i was born in 1992 so i was born like oh, oh I, I, the, I, the super I, nintendo era right it's, yeah but it's the same I, I was born in 93 okay so yeah so we are from the same from the same generation right uh, but I had two older cousins, and I they were they were from a neighbor city, and his their father is actually my godfather. So I usually I used to to visit them and stay with them over the weekend and everything. And they had a Super Nintendo, so I played a lot of Super Nintendo when I was really young, like three four years old. And I played a lot of Street Fighter Two, the World Warrior at that time. And they always beat me. They never gave me an inch of of a handicap, like all the time they were beating me, beating me, beating me. But on the other hand, when I played against my friends, I was so much better than my friends because I was so used to dealing with like uh, older brain addicts that it really, it really made me have a lot of fun. And after a while, they actually lent the Super Nintendo to me, like, okay, just, just keep it for a while and, and have fun. And my, my love for games just never died out. Then I went to, I was, a little bit of a Nintendo fanboy growing up, so I went from the Super Nintendo to a Nintendo 64, then I, I got a Nintendo GameCube, then I got a Game Boy Advance SP, then I got the Wii, I got the Wii U, I have a Switch, and man, it was just, like, games played a really important role in my life, especially because oh, yeah. uh, Same I, I, I don't I don't really like to, to read, uh, and I, of course I understand how, how amazing books are, but I always felt the, the lack of interaction to not like motivate myself too much when I was reading or watching TV and games can bring me to the other to other worlds and make me like <laughs> fixated on them. Games make me feel part of something, and ma games really spoke to me in a sense that it really reward you when you do something right, and that felt amazing. And I and I can't think about any other thing in the world that can bring you to another world, make you live another life. And be part of you from the rest of your life after you played something amazing. Yeah, the, 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 like games are really like I feel like I win. Like one, we would not be talking right now if it wasn't for games. Like, yeah. I, I mean, my, my whole thing kind of revolves around playing like indie games. So, like, if I never got into games, you know, like, yeah, sure, yeah, but, but it's also like inspired future things I want to do, like, games are very really important, and, and, like, games can teach us a lot, which I think sometimes people forget, people think, oh, games are just for fun, you can't really learn anything, but, like, games can teach us a lot, like, especially when it comes to, like, morals and a lot of, like, yes. interesting ideas to, like, eh, explore so you said you did from like brazil what what if you don't mind me asking what was it like being like a gamer in like brazil what what is that like right for me specifically uh like gaming is a is a very popular hobby in brazil but for me specifically it was a little bit different because uh in brazil at first like we still i believe we still uh public private Fabricate? Is that the right word or not? But we we still are making like uh, Mega Drives with like uh, is it Sega Saturn? Uh, I'm not sure because there, there's a, a console from Sega that has like a bunch of names, and people are still playing like old stuff in Brazil. There's like a pixel pixel art love in Brazil that never died out. Uh, I'm, but uh, I mean, so, like gaming uh, Brazil is like. Uh, I mean, retro gaming is still huge. Yeah, yeah, and for me. In, it was interesting because the PlayStation was really, really popular in Brazil. 
and uh, as uh, you might play PlayStation, you may know, PlayStation yeah. One or PlayStation Two, PlayStation One, and then two, then three, because there's something very interesting in Brazil. Of course, as you may guess, soccer is very popular, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So when like the FIFA's from EA and the Pro Evolution Soccer from Konami, I guess, uh, is starting to come to the market. There was a huge influx of players that really love to play. Like they, you play soccer on the street, on the beach, on, on on the soccer field, whatever, and then you go back home and you play soccer on your video game, right? It's, it's amazing. But uh, for me, we love like fighting games, Mario Kart, mm -hmm. uh, fantasy RPGs. Uh, I had fewer friends that that like those kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. so games played a role, which I, I think it was a, a, a very healthy role in my, my life, that every time that I could go out with my friends, I did so. I played a lot of sports, like I'm a karate black, black belt. I, I went to the world, world championship of karate. So I did all the, the outgoing stuff and sports stuff, so I was really healthy. But for those times that I was alone, that I had to entertain myself by myself, right? Uh, there, there were games, there were RPGs and adventure games that were single player experience, but they spoke so, so intimately to me that I felt that it was like to, like my thing, right? Instead of being like the, the social activity that some people have with games like multiplayer every time, games was my introspective time to, to be enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, like I, I love me single player games. I don't have any against multiplayer games. I'll play them here and there to, if and if there's one I'm interested in. But like majority of my the games I play are single player games. So, so what's some of your f favorite games then? Particularly, what's your favorite like single player like experience? Okay, my my favorite single player experience. Ah, that's an easy one. Ah, maybe a tie, but. Uh, maybe there's two two titles that would pull like side by side. Uh, we have Fire Emblem: The Sacred Stones, which is one of my favorite. I've RPGs never, of all time. I've never played a Fire Emblem game. I, I think this the the Sacred Stone is the least played version of the GBA Fire Emblems. Uh, there's a lot of, of people people that really enjoy Fire Emblem, like the Fire Emblem fan base. Uh, calls the Sacred Stone the easiest one and the least interesting one. I don't know, but I just love the characters and was was the first Fire Emblem that I played, so it, I have like a really strong bond with it, and I just love tactics games. Maybe that's why I, I was so into Ever Tried when we tried to put a little bit of tactical RPG sprinkles on it. But I just love turn-based strategy games, and maybe because of that, my other game that side by side with Fire Emblem is Pokemon Sapphire. Uh, I, like we're from the same generation, so I guess you you understand when I say how big of an impact Pokemon had on me growing up. Like, okay, okay, a huge thing, right? Okay, okay, I feel like I'm gonna get like I'm not a big Pokemon fan. Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna surprise not you. I, I, I didn't grow up playing the Pokemon games. Right. I, I never played a Pokemon game when I was a kid. I didn't. I didn't play like my first Pokemon game until I was like in middle school or high school. That's a, an interesting thing because yeah. the the only Pokemon game that I played when I was a kid was Pokemon Station for the N sixty four, but we had the cartoon that was like yeah, yeah, like I liked the I, I liked the cartoon, but in terms right. of like the game, right? The, the games I I I didn't play one until like middle school and like. High school, I, 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 and I still haven't beaten a Pokemon game, though I'm like that with a lot of games. Like I play through quite a bit of games, but beating them like is another story. I can play through games, I can't beat games that often. I, I don't know, maybe I just have like a low attention span, or I, 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 I don't know like where it is. But so your favorite ex uh, experiences are like Fire Emblem and Pokemon. Yeah, specifically those ones, I, I yeah. would say. Uh, I, I have beaten them, like, I I don't know how many times, and I always put myself a new challenge to do that. Like, for instance, in Pokemon, uh, I try to beat it with every type, only team, so six bugs or six have water types. <laughs> I didn't eat all. And, but my actually favorite game of all time is actually not a single-player experience. Oh, really? So that was what, that's why it was tricky for me to answer your question. Uh, single-player and RPGs, for sure. 
What's but, your what's your favorite game of all time then? Right. So my favorite game of all time, which for you is not going to be such a, a surprise because we talked before, but my favorite genre is actually fighting games. And for the Super Nintendo, there's a a small title that most never heard of. It's called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers: The Fighting Edition. So it basically what? picks uh, my uh, favorite genre of fighting games, picks up my favorite brand of all time, which is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and just smashes like, together. This is a fight. I I remember them being like Power Rangers, like beam ups, but I don't remember a fighting game. Yes. I, I I mean yeah, yeah. like an older fighting game. There's like that newer Power Rangers like fighting game, which is pretty cool. But yeah, yeah, but, but it's completely different. the The Super Nintendo fighting game version of Power Rangers has only Mega Swords. There are no what? Rangers. Oh my! So that everyone sounds. Everyone is like either a big monster or a big Mega Sword, and everything feels so heavy and so powerful, and every character plays differently. And there's like an EX mechanic before EX was a thing with Street Fighter. It's just an amazing game. And the amount of love that was put into the game for the story mode, for instance, you, you can only play either as the Thunder Megazord or the Tiger Megazord. And you have like the Red Ranger and the White Ranger and you move around the rest of the team behind the Rangers. So you're you're like trying to pick who you think is coolest. The, like Jason or Tom is like, ah, I can pick. Uh, oh, I've never. I I never heard of this one. I want to talk more, <laughs> but we should kind of avoid the Power Ranger topic, though, because yeah. once we start talking, it will we, 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 just become a Power Ranger podcast. So yes, that's yeah, uh, let's avoid that. I, I will <laughs> say, say I I I do like that newer Power Ranger fighting game they have. Right. My, my my only problem is I feel like the roster needs some improvement. But I, yeah. I, I, I think it is getting better, but yeah, if, if, it needs more work. But other than that, it's a fun, like, fighting right. game. So, so, so my favorite game of all time, you know, since we're sharing favorite game of all time, is yeah. Xenoblade Chronicles. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah. Right now? Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah it's, it, that's interesting because I never played Xenoblade Chronicles, mm -hmm. but like, Every ten people that plays in Oblivion Chronicles, like five, say it's the favorite game of all time. So yeah. it must be like a really heavy hitter. Right? Uh, do you have a Switch? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, they have the definitive edition on Switch. If 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 you want, to give it a try sometime. Yeah, I would love to. However, the exchange rate from the Brazilian reais to the dollar went five to one. So this is something that makes it a little bit harder for me to get. To get a game for the time being, uh, but I'll put on my Christmas list. Christmas <laughs> yeah, but, but, but what's what's interesting about it is this game. So if you ever get a chance to play it, uh, mm -hmm. keep in mind it was originally a Wii game. Okay, keep right. the right. even though the Wii Master is probably looks like prettier. Keep in mind this was originally a Wii game, and that might blow blow your mind, because like for. Like, I think it's the best looking Wii game. Uh, like, it's super impressive that it was like a Wii game because it, it, it has this like open world kind of feel to it. Like, the fact that they were able to like pull that off in like a Wii game, I think it's pretty impressive. So, yeah, there's some there's some titles that it really blows you away when you play, especially when you play like a, a, a port of the game and you say, oh, this was for the Wii? Could the Wii do that? And it's amazing. Xenoblade Chronicles, I think it's a really good, good contender for yeah, the yeah. best graphics. On yeah, the Wii. like, uh, are you a T Tales fan? Tales of? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm a Tales of fan because I played Tales of the Abyss and I mm, didn't like it, but <gasps> I played Tales no of the Abyss. No way! Tales of Abyss is, I... is one of my favorite Tales games. But I, I'm not one to speak because I, I love Tales of Sym Symphony. Symphony or Symphony, it was like amazing. And the sequel for the Wii, which people, I believe they bash it like, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, they don't like too that. Too corny and too cheesy, but I love it. Yeah. Uh, aside from the main character, which like is a totally either an edgelord or someone without no, like no software at all. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy the game and the bad mechanics and the Okay, well, what don't you like right. about Tales of Abyss? Uh, there, 
there's a, there's something with the Tales of series which you are introduced to the mascot of the the party, right? And if you don't like the mascot, things are going to get rough for you. And I really didn't like what, the mascot what, from. What, what, what do you mean by mascot? Uh, I forgot the name of the, the the little guy with the big the big ears. Uh, yeah, but I don't uh, like. I don't think it ruins the experience. Sure, I, I guess it was a little bit of timing issue too, because for me it's it reminds me of Pokemon Sun and Moon. The this of course when you're playing a Tales of it's a Japanese RPG. You have to take your time, sit down, and have the the, the afternoon to to go through, especially the beginning of the game, right? But I guess the first time I tried to play uh, Tales of the Abyss, I I didn't have the patience to go through all the dialogue, and I want to read all the dialogue. So everything that the, the little puppy thing said, like, was like a, a needle to my ears. Like I hate this thing. I hate. This thing, I hate this thing. And when you compare it to like Tenebrae from Tales of Symphony 2, or the the wolf thing that I always forget the name with the the little pipe. Ah, uh, uh, from this. Beria? Yeah, yeah. Uh, repeat? D -d 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 yeah, repeat. B but yeah. what makes him different is he was an actual party member. You, yeah. You, you, you actually got to control and bias him, so he wasn't really okay, a, yeah, a, a mascot, enough. so. Fair enough, fair enough. But Tenebrae, you couldn't play a Tenebrae from Tales of Symphony 2. And he was a blast to have on the party. He was, he was cunning, he, he had like great sense of humor. The, the English dub has like a little bit of a British accent, which was an odd choice, but I guess it played out well. And he was funny. He he adds a lot to the to the dynamic of the party. And but yeah, maybe I should give this of the Abyss a try again yeah. because when the when the battle started going on and it started like unlocking the the mm -hmm. arts cancel with, between each other, it's like yes. Like, did you have a problem with, with the main character? Nah, I, I'm not a fan of of, of him, but he didn't like hinder my experience. Because I know that is a hard thing for, for people to get past with a best. Because like a best has like the best character development, so like the main character does start up right, but he develops so much. But it, it it takes a while to get to that point. But once you get to that point, it's like really good. Like this is the problem with JRPGs. They have that really. Super slow start, but w if right. you can get past that slow start, you're in for a good experience. But like, not everyone has the patience for that, and I totally get yeah. that. I, I like, even as a fan of JRPG, I do acknowledge it's a problem like that needs to be fixed in JRPGs. You know, there needs to, to be a way to, to bear, uh, get players into these experiences a lot faster. So, right. you know, yeah, yeah, but. Like you mentioned, I'd rather have a protagonist that has a really clear flaw, so I can expect it to change, than to have like a, the perfect protagonist, which has, is like he's brave, he's kind, he's strong. Like, eh, that's not interesting at all. I'd rather have like a brat, someone that really has to learn his lesson through the thing, than someone that's always smiling at, at, in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And and I guess that's part of the JRPG genre, right? Yeah. You. you when you start playing a JRPG, you expect to be story heavy. You expect to be a lot of dialogue and a lot of plot points, and I, I think that's that's part of make what makes JRPGs JRPGs. The thing is, if you're not up to that challenge when you start playing, like if you're if you're looking for something something quick to play and you pick up a JRPG for the first time, then you you're making a bad move. Like it's like when you you have to go to the bathroom and start playing Chrono Trigger, like you're not going to finish it. Don't start it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I haven't played Chrono Trigger yet, so. Yeah, that's that's another big one. When people play, they it actually tends to shoot up their their best best of lists, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 and I hear like it's a like investment and an experience, so you know. Right. I yeah. I, I feel like I'm not ready for Chrono Trigger, so. <laughs> you know, I want I want like save it for the perfect time, I guess. You, right, you know, because right. once you be it, you be it. You know. Yes, yes, I I know the the void of finishing something that was amazing. Yeah. I had something similar with Breath of the Wild when when you feel Ganon's like, 
Yeah, and and the thing right, you, no, the thing no. you wish you, you could like unforget your experience, so you can experience yes. it all over again. So, yes. yeah. Yes. So, um, are, are there any games you're currently playing right now? I I, I know you're like super busy with game development. Okay, like, yes. like, like, have you had any time to play any like newer games, or or are, are there any games you're currently just playing? Uh, newer ones, I would say. I would say no. Okay. Uh, for me to to play, it's mostly a a, a time thing. Like between the, the actual Evertry development and I do I do lead game design, I do producing, I do business development, I do social media. Like everything mm -hmm. that's that you don't need aside of uh, from producing and level design. Like everything that you don't need a specific tool set, uh, I'm doing like everything right. So uh, we need to have the artists focus focusing on art and uh, the programmers focusing on programming so everything like in the middle of the gray zone i i try to do so i'm yeah. not doing i'm not playing anything new however the thing that i am playing is i'm replaying pokemon heart heart gold for your dismay i'm you, playing pokemon you, again you, you, you really love the pokemon like i'll play pokemon yeah, I, 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 i'll be a pokemon adventure i i there's just so many pokemon i, I don't know like a good starting place Mm. That's that good. I I guess the the Heart Gold Soul Silver, which is the remake from from the, the Crystal era, is a good place to start because uh, since there has they have a lot of Pokemon from the first generation, you can feel nostalgic and don't feel overwhelmed at all when mm. the, the main play. There's actually there's actually content uh, after you beat the game for the first time, so it feels like there's a lot of bang for your buck, right? Uh, and yeah. there's not not too many like new mechanics for you to 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 figure out. And the the lead four of that game, it's it's okay. If you have a, a good challenge. Um. So, uh, how do you feel about Pokemon Sword and Shield? I have mixed feelings about Pokemon Sword and Shield. <laughs> Is uh, it, I, I think it's interesting. Sorry. Go ahead. Is it about the whole national deck thing or no? That is uh, a controversial subject, right? Because I, I always try to empathize uh, with the, the development studio, especially because since I worked with a publisher before, sometimes like we went during like 3 a.m. make an update with the game, and you you spend the whole night uh, trying to figure out and solve everything. But if your update's like five minutes late, players always shout that you were lazy, you didn't your salary yeah. so i understand the point of of development like sometimes there there are more challenges that we can actually understand right but they did a little bit of data mining with that game and some odd things popped up about data usage not being optimized and i'm, I'm not really uh as well informal on that but i guess they dug their own hole with the whole let's have like a thousand pokemons at some point that's going to be a like a memory problem right Mm -hmm. And maybe they could like. Eh. It's a hard thing to solve, right? Because because you have to put as much content that you can to make a solid experience. Yeah. But and and something is lacking. Of course, you can put DLC, and there's like a whole subject, other subject yeah. about games still being priced at sixty dollars. Yeah. But and, uh, way and more to be made. And the, the, so, like, Pokemon has such like a diehard like. Fan base. If, if you like slightly like screw up or do something they don't agree with, like it's really hard to please and like you know. Yeah, it was the first Pokemon that I actually didn't buy. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Up to but I I blame Sun and Moon for that because I really did not enjoy Sun and Moon at all. So uh, but was... there there are pros and cons mm -hmm. with. With Sword and Shield, they have the the whole explore the world is I, I guess it's a little bit interesting. I, I like quite a natural evolution for the whole series, but I didn't like how they streamlined the XP gain. I didn't like how they there are a lot of things that made Pokemon a, a casual RPG that if you really into, it's actually really hard for. And I felt some of that like for with the the Gigantamax and I forgot the the other thing. Giga Max, I don't know. I, I just thought it was silly, the mechanic, and it really tore a little bit of the, the community for the 
the competitive side of Pokemon. But Sun and Moon has been like trying that, in my opinion, before it. So. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I, 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 I think I get the point. You, you, you really like games. So, when did you want to go from gamer to game developer? When did you make right. that decision? Did you always know you wanted to be a game developer, or no. did having ha did did you make that decision high school, college? Right, I I made that decision. Uh, I guess in the the biggest pressure state that I could have. Uh, after after I graduated high school, I actually went to medical school. So I was studying to become a doctor. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> and I actually went to like the another city. And more towards the, the countryside, which has like a beautiful university. And we have a saying that when you go, I guess it's the same for, for every every country like the US too. When you go more to the Midwest, uh, people tend to be like warmer, kinder, like really mm -hmm. uh, have a, like, I, I really felt uh, they, I had a, a warm reception and everyone took me in and I, like in one week, I had friends for life in medical school, right? But Aww. I noticed that I was the only one that was not very eye about everything. Like I look around and every one of my new friends like were loving the classes and loving the subjects and loving everything about the experience. And I was free, and I was feeling really, not exactly sad, but like without any emotion. Like I was really going to like not being neither happy, not excited, not sad, not melancholy. And I started to realize I was feeling that because I might be feeling a little bit depressed and not realize that I was making a decision that was not what I really wanted to do. Yeah. And I never realized that because after I graduated high school, I, I still didn't know what I wanted to be. So I went with like, I, okay, still I like don't biology. Know. I, I'm still not completely sure what I want to be. So. Yeah, and, and we have the whole life ahead of us yeah. to choose that. But when you have to make the decision when you're 17, like, yeah, of course I'm going to make mistakes. Yeah, I like, think... Who, I, I, who at that age does? I think the problem is, like, parents, teachers put a lot of pressure being, hey, you, you have to decide what you want to do with your life when you graduate, you know? Yeah, I guess for most people that's true. But for me, I, I am really lucky because my parents, although my, my, my father is a doctor, at that time, they had like zero pressure on me. They never told me do this or try that or go study this. Uh, they really always told me like try to find some, something that you love and go for it. But still, uh, I felt I had no direction to go. So I I thought about what subjects during high school I, I liked the most, which were like chemistry and biology, and I figured out okay, let's I try to do something with that. So so I. First thought of biomedicine, which is like more uh, test heavy laboratory kind of things. And then I changed my mind to do medical school because if you are a doctor, you will never have to search for a job because like everyone always needs a doctor. Like every hospital needs a doctor, every clinic needs a, a doctor. So I have, I will be, have, uh, let's say professional stability, go to like to the, the PR and work as a, like, as a, as a doctor there. And why I try to, to work with with the testing things and vaccines and such, and was during medical school like on my I think on the third month, I I had enough, so I called my current business partner Eduardo like Eduardo, like I, I can do this like I'm I'm really unhappy here and every everyone is so kind to me. The so so uh, are uh, uh, to slightly interrupt uh so no, when you called them were you guys array business partners or not yet no, no actually eduardo uh, and i went to school like since we were in diapers oh really yeah we know each other like forever so uh, and he's my best friend too so mm. it was natural for me to to call him so oh, i called him good. like eduardo, like this isn't for me I, i'm really unhappy but everyone is amazing to me and the city is amazing and everything, it's so perfect that I don't understand why I, it feels so wrong to me. And we talked it out and we realized I was making a, a, a career mistake of trying to be a doctor. And he was actually study, was studying to be, uh, I guess, a mechanical engineer at the time at, in another city. So we both 
devise a plan. It's like, okay, so what we, we want to do with our lives? And after talking a lot, we decided that we wanted to try making games. Uh, and I always love to, to, to write stories and try to think of worlds to, to immerse myself in. And Eduardo is a great artist. So we, we knew we wanted to tell stories with the, the media that we love the most, which were games, right? Which was games. So we, we called another friend of, of ours that also studied with us, but was at, at LA at the point, studying like digital arts and trying to work in the cinema industry. And she told us, okay, so if you guys go study design, then you have like a really strong base to build upon. Because if you really understand how to design X, like design a website or design an app or design anything, then you can apply the, that kind of knowledge to games. And then you can try to specialize in something within it. So Eduardo and I dropped from, from our, our universities. He dropped from engineer and I, and I, I dropped from medical school and we started uh, trying to apply for, for design courses in other universities. And we actually ended up studying in different universities, which is also interesting because we brought like a different set of view when we started working together after. So when you, uh, so you, you, you say you dropped out of university, right? I don't know if that's the the right way yeah, to say yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, so you, you was that nerve wracking? Like dropping out of your education? Um, I, I, I guess it was easier on my nerves to exit okay. than when I when I entered. When I entered, I was like almost panicking. Because I didn't know where, where where I was getting into. But when I when I try, when I decided to stop studying med on at, to become a doctor and start to, uh, to start studying to become a designer with, and later a game designer, uh, it felt so right to me that even though like I so did you... I w it would be much more easier to be a doctor, right? Because like mm. my father's a doctor, I can work at any hospital and I can try to be the best doctor that, that I can and be sure that I have financial stability. And now I'm at the, one of the hardest industry to be in, which is entertainment within games that has yeah. like, I don't know, each game, each day is like 2000 games coming up. Oh yeah. And in Brazil that doesn't have like a very stable game industry, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I feel fine. I feel I feel I was made for this. Cause a lot of people are like scared to, you know, drop out and t take like a ch chance. The the the, the afraid, like losing that like stability and right and going that like entrepreneur like path. Cause there's no guarantee, you know, this might fail and stuff. So, so, so do you have any advice about that? Yes, I do. Okay. Have a plan. Have a plan is the best advice that I can. And what I mean with have a plan is don't take any step that you can afford to take. So for me, I was lucky enough that if I if I stop studying med at medical school, I have parents that were first okay with it, which is really important, and which said to me, yes, try another thing, see if that's what you want, and if it doesn't, then, then try again. So I had the structure for me to take the risk. If you can't take that risk, then take your time to really know yourself. Like try, try doing things on the side. For instance, if you're ready to be, let's say, a lawyer, uh, try to make a game on, on the weekend. See how you feel. Because if you try to make something for yourself and really start putting your hands within game development, even the smallest scale, it doesn't have to be like a complete game. Just start with the smallest mechanic you can think of. And it feels right, then you can you can think about making a a more steady switch, because I feel it's not reasonable to, for me to tell people yes, drop from your work, like ex, exit all everything that you have chosen to be, and take take a take a a leap of faith, because life's not about leap of faith. Life is about taking risks that you can afford to take. And another good example is actually my fiance. Uh, she's a lawyer, like she. She went to law school. She's actually a lawyer. She actually ended up working to the to the Brazilian Navy, 
as a lawyer with, oh, with the Navy. That's pretty and cool. She, and she acted everything because her love is 3D animation. Oh. So she made a career in, in as like as a lawyer. And but she earned enough for her to take like one, two years just to focus on 3D animation and really try to figure out if she can live of it. And I guess this is a good plan, like create create a situation for yourself where if everything goes wrong, you you're not like you're not left to 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 the to chance, right? You can mm -hmm. still figure things together. And if it doesn't work out, out for her like in the next two, three years, she can come back to working as a lawyer and try again in the future. We have our whole lives to try to find what we love and do what we love. Uh, we don't have to to risk it all. We can learn step by step the best way that we we can learn about yeah, how to be happy. Yeah, yeah I, I th think like at the end of the day, you have to find out what makes you happy. You know, yes. and, and not just that. I think it's also important to define what is happiness. Yes. What do you define as happiness? Because what I define as being happy may be different than what you defined as being happy, you know? Right. Right, exactly. And there's a very good analogy there about happiness and success. And I, I think you couldn't say it better, Nana. Yeah, you have to first cause... think of about what happiness is for you. Mm -hmm. And the key is for you, because mm -hmm. for you, happiness can be like, yeah, I want to live by my own with my dog and have enough money to pay the bills and maybe have a uh, go on vacation once a year. That's happiness for you. And happiness for, for another person would be like, I need to buy a new car every day and I need to have eight kids. And uh, Sure. You have, to, you have to adjust your dream based on the effort you're willing to, to put into, right? Or the contrary, you have to put enough effort to to afford your dreams, right? And success is the same thing. Like when we're talking about game development and and when you present a pitch to a publisher or a, a potential business partner, and you have to convince them there's potential for success there. And if you ask anyone about like consultancy or want, want someone to help with your pitch, most likely the first question is, what is success for you? Because for an indie title, it could be sell 30,000 copies and that's a, success or for a really niche title it could be like like for a, a niche fighting game it could be like having their trailer at evil in the middle of the year like the, the biggest or or, or or may, may, may not be a financial thing maybe you define yeah. success as exactly. as people enjoying your game and as long as people enjoy your game you're happy yeah. and that, that's fine if that works for you but there's also people who want to define uh, the success and happiness uh, by c how much money and, and how it's growing the company and and, the, right. and that is valid too it, it's all about your like personal perspective and you, you gotta do what 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 you feel is right exactly exactly and for me success is being able to make games in a way that each game each game allows me to do the next one mm -hmm. and live in a sustainable manner. That's all that I ask, and that's all what Lunic Games is all about. And happiness for me is able to live the whole life, with my, my whole life with my fiance, have a dog, have two kids. I just want to have a, a, a comfortable home and be able to live with my family. And mm -hmm. when I say family, of course, that's include, that includes a dog because a house with no dog, like, I don't know what, what's the point. So, and yeah, and happiness changed for everyone. We just have to keep chasing it. And what about you, Nano? What's happiness for you? I, I'm still trying to honestly figure that out. I, I, I think like, if I would define success, is making something people enjoy. Right. And not just like enjoy, kind of enjoyment that inspires people, and maybe sparks a conversation like that. That can like cultivate a dedicated like fan base and following, and like connect with people, you know. And right. for happiness, 
I, I, I still don't know what happiness truly is for me, because I, I, I haven't, like, really mentioned to you, but I, I deal with a lot of, like, anxieties and, like, depressions and stuff, so I'm still, I'm, I'm still, like, working on myself, but I guess that's divine to ask. I, 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 I just want to be happy and I think, like, feel good to myself and feel like I'm accomplishing something. And, and and I guess more than that, I want like leave a legacy. Cause I don't want p people. Cause one of my anxieties, and I, I think that sometimes gets me depressed, is like, what happens when I'm dead? Like, is anyone gonna remember me? I I, I, I want people to actually like, like a hundred years from now, like remember me and remember what I what what I did in life and what I created. So I. I know that that's kind of getting deep, but no, and I think it's interesting because for me, your your happiness and your success both talk about making an impact in other people's life, yeah. right? Like you, you don't want to to be like like a, a blog that uh one, one person once reads, like you want to be something that makes part of that that person's life, right? And it it actually is profound, although in in actuality, it, it's really possible. Like when we talk about your our favorite like content creator, our favorite YouTuber, and how much that weight is weights in in our lives today, and uh, that's being part of someone's life, right? And we talk about those things, they influence us, and it really moves our our world, like. When we see like a, a video that really talks to us, or a, a podcast that really helps us through that tough time, or really are there when we're working, this is having an impact on people's life that leaves a legacy. So I think that's a very interesting like target to have on one's life. That's why like I started like Nano's Indie Cafe. Like I wanted to create something that like helped indies and and encouraged them and. To give them a place to talk about what they were working on, and that's why I also have the YouTube channel because I st I still have like all these videos. Hopefully forever. It depends like if YouTube ever takes them down, but that's a whole other story. But I want to have this like legacy, uh, of like content because well, 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 well yes, obviously I, I am trying to turn into business, and I, and I would like to make like a profit for me it's more, more about like the quality of, to me like quality of content always comes first and i i know that can be difficult in a business you have to balance that quality with actually like turning a profit but like i want to make like the best content on the planet that can inspire people Yeah, that that's. I think I uh, I can relate to that because of course, everyone needs money to live, and I guess most people want to do something with their of the best of their capabilities. But when you're more invested into making something special than to making money, you can always compromise on how much you make, but you can never compromise on how how much effort you put into it, right? And I think that really speaks volumes about having good like word ethics and having a really good drive behind everything you do and when you have like a, a success or happiness go in mind and you have good ethics and a good a good drive behind you of course you're going to have the same challenges as everyone does you have you're going to have to leap over mountains and in your life and you're going to have each time a biggest a bigger challenge than you had but is that drive and that motivation and the vision of what we really want to make is what pushes you through that ultimate, right? Because uh, once it is done, even if like things like fail, I can still be proud of proud that I made good content, that I made yeah. something that even if it only connected and reached a couple of people, I can say I did that. I was a part of that and. That I don't know that that's a good feeling to me. Yeah, yeah, I can completely relate. 
I, it if, doesn't. If you always it, do your it, best. You it, it, it doesn't always work that well with, with business, but like, I, I'm a more like creative person, so. Right, right, yeah. The 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 key between balance of business and creativity is it's a really delicate balance, right? But if if you do your best, like my father used to say that to me when I was when I went to like karate tournaments, it's like just do your best because yeah. then you you don't yeah. going to regret anything. Yeah. I've, I, and like and if you get a medal and if you get a good prize, that's the outcome. But the outcome really doesn't depend on you if you do your best. You just have to do your best. Yeah, I, I've always been raised about about doing hard work. Right. You, you know, I've I've always had the hard work mentality even though i do personally get distracted though i have gotten bear on that but but yeah we, we, we went to like a deep conversation <laughs> about that and we, we we still haven't quite got to the uh game but uh so you said you you think it's the design so like how did you start learning that craft how long did it take to get to that craft right uh, i would say i i love working as a designer, but I would say that my biggest role, especially in enterprise, is being a producer, like okay. trying to, to lead the team. So uh, but... what is a what is a game producer? Because I'm always confused ah. about different roles of like entertainment and, and what they are. Because people draw in a lot of buzzwords, like producer, like, but, but uh, are you really a producer? Like, what does a producer right. do, you know? Right. Uh... I guess the, the explanation that I can give about what what my role is in a, as a producer will at first sound really cheesy, but then things start sinking in. Okay. And okay, so my role as a producer is to make sure that the the game is getting made, right? So when we're talking about game development, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different areas that have to communicate between themselves, right? You have the art department and the programming and music and design. And they have to all work within a single vision that's working, right? Mm -hmm. And in big studios, you actually have a director, which is making sure that the vision is being made. Mm -hmm. And there is another guy called the producer, which is making sure that the, the product, which is a game, is getting made. So, so are, to... are, 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 are like producers more or less like product managers then? Um, yeah, you could say it's more towards product manager, but the biggest tool in a producer box, in the producer toolbox, is leading, it's, it's relating, relating to, to dealing with people, right? Mm -hmm. Relationships and everything. So my job as a producer is to make sure everyone is communicating. We have like a timeline, a schedule, we know what's going to be made by whom, how much is going to cost, everyone's getting paid, uh, everyone is not hungry. I have to make sure that everything that's not related to the, the person doing it, its job uh, is being taken care of. So I, the the role of the producer is making sure no one is like, everyone knows what they're supposed to do and when things are going to get made, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in mid-sized team, which is our case, uh, I also double as like a business development person. So I go, I I, I try to to talk with publishers. I talk to I talk to I try to talk with like marketing teams to try to figure out the best way to promote ever try. I try to talk with any any kind of like business partner for localization and everything, um, and I, I have to make sure everyone is communicating in the same language, right? So I guess the, the role of the producer is is almost like mm, I, I don't it's closer to I, I guess the I don't know, I don't I don't have an analogy the whole the whole the role of the producer making sure everyone is doing their job in the most efficient way possible so the game can be made. Okay, okay. That is okay. But if you ask, uh, like for instance, in our team, if you ask, uh, I guess our programmer about what's the role of the producer, he would say like the the role of the producer is not having that is having nothing to do because everything is being taken care of. And I guess yeah, that's true. The best scenario for a producer so, is everyone is doing their work like that. That that that's kind of what was what was the, like when it was. Since your job is making sure everyone else kind of does their job and the game gets done, what is your like day to day routine revolving around right. the game? Right, right. That's interesting. 
because uh, I do I have two two major roles, right? Which is like lead, lead game designer and producer. But for for for, uh, for producing, it's like at the beginning of the project, there's a lot of work because we have to figure out uh, each step of the way what we should do first and what are the our biggest goal that we want to get first for instance are we going to make like an mvp to show at an, an event or a conference are we going to, to tackle a, a publisher with an early prototype are we going to finish like the first level of the game and try to work with a big name our brand try to promote it with youtube and everything so the the role of the producer at the start of the of the project is to to define the vision of the game to to define the roles of everyone else and the first steps that have to be made made right and right in the middle of, of, of the game production, my, my role as producer had less of an impact because everyone was already on track. We already had goals set. We were on schedule. So everything was like great. So I, I, I worked more as like a lead level designer. Not, sorry, not lead level designer, a lead designer for combat and everything. Right, to work a lot of, with the content. And after we, we started talking about the Kickstarter and the strategy and the the launching of the game getting is getting closer. My role as a producer like started increasing again because then we have less room for mistakes and people really have to understand what's the next test. So it ends up that my my day to day is checking the schedule and talking to everyone to make sure everyone knows I know what they are doing and they know what's next for them. I have to work out with everyone if there's any kind of gap in communication or any kind of roadblock like uh, the, an art guy is having problem solving an art problem that needs like the programming assistance. Then I need to work that out and make sure that everyone's doing okay. Then I talk with everyone that has any kind of stakeholder in the project. So any kind of partner that we're talking about, if people are asking about localization, I try to, to figure out prices and send word counts. And then I do a lot of emails regarding like conference and try to apply the, the game for as many showcases that we can. Uh, speaking of which, Everdrive is going to be a Tokyo game show with uh, an online booth. So oh, this is th one of that's the, the things that we got. <laughs> that's that's dope. Right, and so it's a lot about making sure that we have like a, a a blueprint of everything that's going on, and then there's nothing in the way of things getting done. And as soon as that's on that's on track, then I jump in with game design and start working with. With the real content of the game right okay so how did you like learn your craft right interesting that's an interesting thing uh i my the school that i went with eduardo had a really strong program to work out like different profiles because of course th there's a, a lot of ways that you can teach children right so Generally, schools use a certain philosophy behind how they teach. Mm -hmm. And I went with a school called Jean Piaget, which is called, which is named after uh, a psychologist, a, a children's psychologist, which really, really taught us about how if you give the children, if you give children the tools, they can use the tools to learn by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about when you figure things out for yourself, it really sticks more to your brain than when someone t tells you about it, right? And we had like a lot of programs about yeah, researching anything and presenting to the class and we have competition about presentation. And I always really love to be like the center of the attention, trying to be a leader, try to figure everyone out, uh, try to figure out how everyone can pitch in to make something bigger. So I guess there is when becoming like a producer kind of person started working out. Uh, but but to be frank, in my in my earlier years as a developer, I thought that I should be a producer because I was not a very good artist. I was not a programmer. I don't play any instruments. So it's like, yeah, maybe I should be a producer because uh, to be a producer, you really have to be good with with team building and schedule and everything. You have to be organized, but you don't have to. To have specifically a, a particular skill set that really takes a lot of time to develop, in my perspective, right? And of course, I was wrong. I learned that after, but but I thought that I should be like the one coordinating everything because I was not too good at any other field. 
But turns out I really love being like the centerpiece of projects. I really love trying to to make an indie project the most like confident project that it can because something that I really believe in is although you're making an indie game with a small team, if you have like a really business focused mindset and you work like in a you can kid around, but if you work with a serious ethic, then this is going to make a difference in the market because then people is, are going to take you more seriously. So this this kind of mindset is something that I, I really love to pour into every project that we work with. And for as for my game designer half of the brain, I guess it started out when I, when I played with Transformers because I love figuring out how things work. And I try to, to create my own Transformers by drawing on paper, like, yeah, and then every, this is going to paint here, and the head is going to go there. So my first like job, my, my first dream job when I was eight was to be like a toy designer. So I guess I am kind of a toy designer, but the toy that I make is digital interactive instead of analogic, right? Uh, but yeah, I guess it, it was more of an organic kind of, of uh, discovery about myself than actually me thinking about what kind of person would I like to be within the game industry. Very uh, <clears throat> interesting. I, I think like for me, if I would to ever make a game, I probably may, maybe do direct directing or like writing. The thing that like gives me creative control, because I'm like right. such a, a control freak. It, it like has to be my vision. Right. Right. Yeah, that's more like a director I would think. Yeah, so, and, and, and like, a, a lot of the games I would like to make are very story-based, so. Mm, right, so you would double as a, a, uh, a story writer, a storyboard artist, and everything that's story-related? Uh, yeah, probably, like, maybe, like, lead writer, or at least the, the person that approves the, like, right, uh, right. S script and stuff. I, I probably be working with uh, other, like, writers, and we go back and forth and stuff, so. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a director to me. Yeah. I. I, I know. I, I, I. Yeah. I'm just a control freak. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I wasn't, but like I have visions. I want things done certain way. I. 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 I, I understand. Like I'm a difficult person to work with. And, and stuff. I. I. Kind of get get that, but like I have my creative like visions it's like th th these are like my babies i want them to be treated you know well you know right right so th that's why i feel like I, I need to be the one like in charge of things so right and yeah of, of course when you have like a really strong vision you want to make sure that everyone that's pitching in is telling the story that you want to tell right yeah but one thing that really really helps is when you surround yourself with people that are better than you, it's much easier to delegate. Like when you talk, for instance, like you have a story in your head and you talk to like a, a narrative designer or a story writer about your story and then can really pick that up and, and make it in a way that's so perfect and so much better because they have all the techniques to make it more exciting, right? And they give back to you like, yeah, exactly what I wanted, but better, and they really turn it to, turn up to eleven. And so, surround yourself with people that are better than you in, on each of their fields. Mm -hmm. uh, really helps, like being confident about letting go of your ideas and letting people come in with within your realm and pitching in how to make the most amazing experience that they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's hard, man, because like at least with like. Taking my, my dream project for example, right. I, I I do have like an end game for for the narrative. I, I, I have like a certain ending ending I, I want to make sure is achieved. You know, right? Because I think in narratives, especially if it's like a long running narrative, it's important to have your ending planned first. So, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh. I guess let's finally talk about your game. So, what's your game about? Yeah, so Evertry is a game, is a isometric turn-based roguelite, uh, which is all about conquering afterlife. 
So uh, uh, start behind. So would you like to explain what like a roguelike is? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I would do my best because that is also a, a, a kind of interesting subject because people have different opinions and it's kind of subgenre. No, it's a genre. It's like talking about Metroidvania. So I'll do my best about explaining how I see things, right? But roguelikes are all about the core mechanic loop, right? So generally, they they have a more challenging difficulty to play, right? But every time that you die, they generally have you back at the start of the game. And they're all about figuring out the core mechanics, be it combat or puzzle or anything, and trying to finish the game in one go or try to explore as much as, as you yeah, can about it. Yeah, yeah. It's about like dying and and with, with, with each attempt you get better and better until right. finally you can be it. Or like me, take like 10 minutes to get past the t t tutorial. <laughs> right, it's a very it's a very specific genre that very specific people like. And for a roguelite, which is like a subcategory of roguelike, roguelikes, is less of a... Uh, unforgiving kind of scenario. In roguelites, you keep something from every run that you have to make it easier the more you play, right? Mm -hmm. So some roguelites allow you to, to level up or acquire more powers or have better items or, I don't know, or even have checkpoints during your, your next run, right? Mm -hmm. And Evertrite is more of a roguelite because there are some mechanics that make sure that every run that you, you make inside the tower actually helps you become a little bit stronger. But in the end, it's all about how much you can master the main mechanics to try, die again, and try again, and try to reach the, the end of the game in one go. Cool. Yes, that's the best I can do about roguelites and rogue, roguelikes, right? Mm -hmm. So, and in Never Try, the story is about you waking up, you, the main character, which is a fallen warrior, mm -hmm. waking up without any memory of his previous life, but he's told that he was a warrior, a warrior in his previous life. But he didn't have like uh, he didn't lie, die in, with honor. So since he was a warrior, but he didn't die with honor, he must prove his worth by climbing through a mysterious tower to show the gods that he's actually uh, uh, he's actually worthy of the afterlife, right? So the first mystery is how did you die, right? Because if if you were a warrior and didn't die with honor, that's, that's a good question. But the tower serves like as a limbo between to, to, to make, to like a, of a, a judgment place to see if, you, if you're worthy enough to ascend to that flight. Mm -hmm. And in Never Tried, you start ascending this tower by going floor by floor. And each floor is a seven by seven grid of tiles and have enemies and traps and hazards that are meant to try you. So, but every time you make a move, everything in the floor also moves. So it's like uh, an into the bridge kind of strategy game mm -hmm. with a mystery dungeon flow to how everything moves after you do. Uh, but although it's turn based, uh, you control the pacing, right? Because every time you move, everything moves. So if you move fast, everything's going to move fast. If you take your time and take each turn slowly, everything's going to move slowly. So it's really up to you how fast you want to play the game. However, every time you make a, a quick decision, you have a focus bar that increases your focus level. And by increasing your focus level, not only you earn more shards, which is the game's soft currency from killing monsters, but it also unlocks more powers to your character. So the faster you, you play, the more powerful you become, but you also have less time to think about your strategy. So it's really a balance between how you want to play the game and how you want to approach the turn-based but fast-paced action that Evertrite brings. And aside from uh, from going up the tower each floor, every five floors you can encounter a store when you can purchase uh, abilities and modifiers. Yeah, which are I, like I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even make it t to the store. <laughs> and sorry if the difficulty is a little too high within our demo, but every store you can you can spend those shards that you earn by defeating enemies to create your own build, right? So you mm -hmm. can acquire active skills which use charges, basically your mana, to 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 summon special effects, 
And there are also modifiers, which actually trigger based on your focus level and can give you passive abilities like stunning enemies that hit you or absorbing damage with your mana instead of your health. So it's about moving around enemies, maneuvering them to, to trigger traps and try to stay alive as much as you can while, while also acquiring powers and using them so they become even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so how did you come up with, with, with the concept of your game? Right, so at the beginning of, of development, as I mentioned before, we met with Danilo, which had the skeleton of the game. So he had uh, a game about a 7x7 seven seven grid, where if you, if you hit every kind of obstacle on the floor, you go to the next floor. And he wanted to make something that was procedurally generated, in, in a way. And he didn't have much of uh, a design behind it, but he has like a, a, a mechanic loop, right? And we, were, and we were thinking about how to bring this mechanic about procedurally generated floors in turn-based combat that keeps going and going. So as Danilo was, was looking for a creative team, we actually have to, to think about the context of this game, how we would put a theme behind it, how we would like, give a reason why you're climbing, what's the end game, and where you're going through there. So the first step that we had was thinking about the, the lore behind every ride. And I won't spoil too much because there's a lot of mysteries that we're going to actually answer during the main game. But there is the, the tower was made to to test Lost Souls, right? So we took a little bit of inspiration from the Divine Comedy of the Dante's Inferno. And every 10 floors of the tower has a theme behind it, which is actually the the five stages of grief. So it, the souls start with the denial of that they are dead. Mm -hmm. They go through the anger of being dead, then they try to bargain for their lost soul to ascend. Then they go through depression of never being able to be alive again. And then you have to accept the fact that you're dead and you have the, the chance to go to the afterlife. And we try to put mechanics behind it. So it's not just a narrative standpoint of how we think things with visuals and enemies and everything, but how you play the game as also takes uh, there's a lot of relation of the, the, how you interact with enemies and the traps within each floor. And after we decided to, to craft the, the lore behind the tower and who created it and why it's everything the way it is and who is the shopkeeper of the tower and why he's there, uh, we, we then started doing the, the character design and thinking about enemies. And there was a lot of iteration behind it, right? The best way to, for you to test if your game design is going through a good direction is for you to make the prototype as quick as you can and ask people to play it. Oh, yeah. So we we made a demo. The, our first demo, which was like the, our pre-alpha build, we went to a very, very, very small group of people during an event called Firmeza in Brazil. And he was more. this event is more like an event by developers to other developers, so there's a lot of people like Ningo and talking experience and everything, so, and we learned a, a lot about that. So is it kind of like GGC kind of? Like, like half percent of the GDC. Okay. I think about you take a you, you take a city in Brazil which doesn't have like the biggest gaming industry in the world, right? And you think about just the small indie development developers of that scene and then you pick like a random weekend and try to see how many of them showed up in one city. Okay. This is like for me, so it's a very like roots kind of indie scene mingle event. Okay. But through that event we learn about what was fun about the Ride and what wasn't working in Ever Tried. And we especially I actually made a post in our Kickstarter page about designing Ever Tried because the biggest the biggest challenge that we have with Ever Tried is that the player only has three health and enemies either have one or two health. So when we started out with abilities that dealt like three damage and four damage and above the doubles your output, that's meaningless because if you hit if you kill uh, an enemy in two hits, you don't need to do like five damage, right? So we started figuring out how it's less of a, a turn based RPG and it's more like a puzzle ish kind of gameplay. Especially because what players liked the most in Ever Tried at that point was baiting enemies into hazards. 
they really wanted to make the enemies die to the traps instead of act actively trying to kill them by themselves, right? So it really sparks our, our brain about making sure that the traps are interesting to interact with, making sure there's a lot of opportunity to, to players to interact with them and bait enemies, and also creating a, a variety of skills that don't rely solely on doing damage, but actually interacting with the other core mechanics of the game. So, and after that, we, we, uh, we had our Discord channel with our alpha testers, mm -hmm. and they really, helped, they really helped us a lot about understanding what was doing great and what wasn't that fun. And it, we kept doing this, this cycle of trying something new and asking people to, to test the game up to the point that we reached the, the current city of every Friday, which everyone can, can try with the, our Kickstarter demo. And the amount of love and support that we have received from the demo, saying like, especially from the people that really like this kind of genre, because I know it's not for everyone, this kind of genre, right? But people seem to really enjoy the, the strategy behind every tried, and they feel like movement really takes a big part in the game. And every time that the player dies, it's actually the player learning about what they did and what they could do better. And that's 100% what we, we want people to feel like. Every Every step that you take is a key movement that can that can decide if you're going to die or not, right? And people and players are really taking this kind of uh, feeling that we wanted to create. Okay. Is the... <clears throat> so you mentioned before you have like a team. So how many people are like in your team and like how did you guys like the best function in your team? How do you m m make sure everyone's on the same pace, on track, and you m make sure stuff gets done? Because it can be really hard working with other people. Right, right, right. Yeah, we have six people on, on the Evertrade team, but Evertrade team is actually a partnership between Danilo Dominguez, which is like the, the programmer, mm -hmm. and there's also another game designer called Gabriel Zanini, which is like his his business partner mm -hmm. and we are loaded games we are a team of four people and we, are, we have already been working together so for us it was really easy being the, the, the creative direction of the, the game and me mm -hmm. being the head of like the business direction of the of the team it wasn't too hard for us of course every time you, you have a, any kind of combination of people that you don't know which for us was were Danilo and Gabriel there's a lot of questions behind would, would it work out? Can how will our relationship turn out? But it, we actually f function really well together. Like our, our team, our, I couldn't ask for better people to work with me at Lunic Games. And Danilo is a very competent programmer. He, he does a really good job in making sure that we have all the tools that we need to to work our design. So every time that Danilo programs something new, is never a hassle for the design team try to work out how does that work. It always has the tools. He really can think ahead of how the design needs to interact with the game. So I guess I was lucky with with people that have good uh, a good chemistry to work together. Yeah, uh, so do you uh, like have any tips for small indies who are trying to find a, t find a team and how to form a team and sure. how to, to, to make that work a lot like is there like a craigslist for finding team members right right that's good good question the first thing that I would say is if you're considering anyone to work together then arrange like a, a weekend for a game jam with the, that person right mm -hmm. try to figure out how the games goes. Uh, uh, before you commit with something big then like, get there's up. global game jam and look them there. Try to even create your own game jam and try to, to see how it goes. Uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, and also those quite a few game jams on edge you can also do. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the best way to know how you would work with another developer is develop something with them, right? So there's mm -hmm. no no cure for that. So yeah, pick up like a project just to try out how the the, the relationship goes and try to 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 put yourself in other people's shoes as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes everyone has the best interests of the game in their head and their heart, right? But the strategy can differ. And if you can understand 
each time that there is a problem in communication, if there is a uh, an issue of communication, there's an issue of people don't see don't see don't see the the other guy's point, of, but they still want the same goal, right? Or if there's an ego issue, because and that's more common than you might think. Like sometimes people have have a very delicate ego, so you have to really try not to to pander in them or not to talk down to them and try to really reach a point where everyone feels hurt but you still have to make a commitment right mm -hmm. so the, i guess the, the third point would be be sure that the expectations for what you're working with are clear to everyone if you're making a commercial game down the line i don't know i don't care if it's going to take one two three years make sure that the objective is clear to everyone so when you have to make a decision and people can agree with with the decision and everyone's taking side, there is some some place a rule that already says who makes the decision and how the decision is made. So and everyone has had to had agreed with that like way on the first week. And I guess that ties in with if you're making something commercial, have a contract, have something law abiding to everyone, be feel safe and feel they are protected during the development because you can never guess what's going to happen and of, of course when you make a contract you're not thinking about the you're not wishing that the game is going to go wrong right but you're protecting everyone including your business partner mm -hmm. when you do a contract so make sure uh, anyone no one is taking unnecessary risk and everyone knows why you why you are, are you there and the rules that are applied when something goes wrong when people disagree who makes the call when we have to choose a platform and nobody has a, a clear vision of how does the process go. And as soon as you have like a really, it's like making a, a sport of any kind. Really define the rules of the game, then play to the best of your capabilities. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess one part you didn't quite, let's say you're like the programmer. But you suck at art and, and you don't know anyone. Like, how do you go about Finding like an artist, right? Any, uh, any, first thing. Sorry, go ahead. Any advice for like finding team members you don't have a little? Sure. If 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 you don't like know anyone, like it, it's one thing if you know people, but like not everyone, you know, know someone. Some people don't have many friends or have like no friends. So, right, right. Uh, I I guess. The first tip is the same as the previous one. It's like go to game jams. Like especially, of course, we are during a pandemic, so yeah. stay at home. Yeah, yeah. But but every time you have the opportunity, after we are vaccinated and everyone is secured, uh, if you if you can mingle with people during well, game jams, well, that's uh, great. Uh, 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 also, there are like online game jams and uh, c yes, exactly. communities to find partners and there's like a ton of like game dev facebook groups yeah yeah so start like showing up and start posting about your work like be vocal about what you like what you want, want to make and what you're working with and what you're looking for there's a hundred of like discord channels as well of like indie developers looking for teams that you can like just shout out your ideas who you're looking for and try things out so uh, yeah. go ahead and join like game champs groups like Facebook groups, Discord groups, like yeah. HEO, yeah. like you know, Reddit posts, and, and like, uh, talk uh, about it. And and please go to Twitter because oh yeah, we have Facebook, Instagram, and everything, but nothing beats Twitter yeah, right now. Like Twitter's game development. Yeah, like Twitter's really good at finding like people to do work for you. Like right. the, there's like a bunch of like hashtags for like artists and stuff. Just like put like a post. Being, hey, I'm looking for some hours, and you don't necessarily need to find like a full time like, like team member or employee. You you can like j j just like d contract them or like outsource them. Right. Like right. five five, I I think is a good tool. Like I've seen p p people, uh, get all the like game art just from Fiverr. So. And and I guess the secret trick, the secret tip would be don't be afraid to to work on your own game even though you don't have an artist. Yeah. Like when we talk about games such as Mini Metro, like amazing puzzle game, 
beautiful. And what, what are you talking? How would we describe the art? Like it's colors and basic shapes, and that's it. So yeah, you don't like need... like art isn't everything in a game. While it is an important piece, it doesn't always like make it right a good game. If you 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 should but focus more on like gameplay and making like a solid interactive experience you know right right exactly if you if you have a game that you want to make and when we talk about games the the heart of the game is the game design right it's the gameplay like you said mm -hmm. so if you want if you want really to make a mechanic then go for it like try to think about how how you can make it work with what you have there was there's a saying of uh uh uh, drawing teacher that I had, which is, which was, I'm trying to, I will try my best to, to translate it to English. Is start, start from where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. That's it. So, what like tools and like engines do, do, do you guys like use for development? Do do do. do have your own like engine from scratch you use unity unreal game maker right. uh html5 maybe <laughs> i actually almost worked with html5 uh at the beginning of lunic games like we had no um uh, no 100 percent focus programmer right so i like i said before if there any any kind of job that someone needs to do then my job is to do it, right? So I started learning programming. And at the time, we were using Construct, which was, it's a, it's a game maker, not game maker like the software, but it's like, it's a game making tool, especially for people that don't, that don't know programming, don't know any language, because there's a lot of, of snippets of behaviors that you can plug in together and then things start to work out the way that we want. But after a while, it stopped having the support that we needed for mobile games. So I started learning Unity and C Sharp. So then I started learning Unity and C Sharp. And actually, ever tried this day is being made with Unity as well. And Unity is a great tool. Maybe not. It's it's starting to become a great tool for 2D games, but it was not the case like for for its whole yeah. history, yeah. right? But it, the the best thing about Unity, in my perspective, it's one of the easiest platforms for you to port to other consoles more mm -hmm. to other platforms right and most platforms have a really easy time working with unity so this is one of the the reasons why we were really confident having a stretch goal for porting the, the game for consoles and like every console basically is because we talk with other business partners that could help us with porting the game if we actually get to the stretch goal and having the game on unity was really really made our job easier on that front Like, would you recommend like Unity over other game engines, or what's your philosophy when it comes about choosing a game engine? Right. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I guess when you want to, to choose a game engine, you have to think about what what's your goal, right? So mm -hmm. for for us, we chose Unity because we knew that if I wanted to learn program programming, I would need as much help that I needed. And Unity is one of the most popular like two engines that there, there is. So the amount of resource that you can oh, yeah. find from forums and tutorials and free tutorials uh, was the biggest appealing factor for us. And that's why we chose Unity, because it's a proven engine that we know a lot of successful games already use, especially with commercial titles. Uh, we know there's like the biggest support behind it terms of community and kind and the amount of information that we can have for the platform for the engine and also it ports really easily so that's why we chose unity but it doesn't mean that it's the best engine like i didn't have i don't have much experience with other engines to compare and compress them, right yeah, and yeah, i'm not yeah. even like a technical guy but my best my best tip would be think about what you want to achieve and then do your own research about what kind of games using each of those engines and look like and are this kind of experience something that you, you want and try to really dig into the, the amount of complaints and challenges that most engines tend to have and think about what kind of challenge you want to accept for yourself.
Yeah, like um, my some of my personal take, I, I would say, find the engine that works best for you. But sure. like, if Game Maker what works best for you, use Game Maker. If right. Unity, you know, because uh, it, it's not a, 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 about the tool; it's about how you use the tool. Like I've seen some amazing games in Game Maker. Yes, exactly. Do, 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 but do, do be aware, well, not like every game engine that does 2D and not every game engine does 3D. Right. So, so, so keep that in mind when choosing like a game engine. Though, there's always like work away. Like, like, like I've actually seen people do 3D stuff in Game Maker. I, I don't know how. They're like mad geniuses. They <laughs> know like magic. Yeah, yeah, they know some, they know some game maker magic, man. Like, right, it's right. it's it, it, it really is impressive what what people have done in game maker. Like I used to think, oh, game makers just people who are making games for fun. You, you can't do that. But 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 from like doing that as any cafe and playing more indie games, I'm like, whoa, this is making game maker. Whoa, whoa, yeah. like so, people can really push game maker to its limits and it's very impressive so so it's about like it's really about like execution right exactly you you want of course to choose the name a name that leaves the the least amount of technical challenge to you so of course yeah. if you want to make a really high-end 3d ultra realistic game then you, you shouldn't pick like construct for web like html kind of game you yeah. should Probably go with Unreal, especially if they have like a new engine. And I think but, you, yeah, you, but of course you, you can get whatever you want. The, the question is, which which tools you're going to get from each engine, mm -hmm. and what fits you the best. But of course, as you said, mm -hmm. in the end, people aren't going to play the engine that you chose. They're going to play your game. So yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. That you choose is the best for your game. Mm -hmm. And you also need to consider what skills do you rain know, like what. What engines do you rain and know that no and like build from there? I sure. think, right, right, yeah, yeah. Have to find a way to translate your knowledge in the with the least amount of of issues. Like, like for example, if you know a lot of C sharp, start with Unity, because yeah. you you know like C C sharp. If you're a very talented. Uh, level designer and level, like level designing kind of like interfaces then I, I honestly I think like Unreal is a good place to start especially since like Unreal has like blueprints and stuff so you don't necessarily like right. need programming like I've seen people make full games with, with just blueprints so right right yeah the 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 barrier to people start working with games, especially without any coding background, is getting lower and lower. So yeah, I yeah. guess engines are doing a really good job into making sure that yeah. people have access. And yeah. and I guess it's it really for me it's a good analogy with fighting games. Like you can introduce as much tools that you want to make sure that everyone can play and make a combo. But in the end of the day, people that really enjoy fighting games will learn the hard way to do things. And for mm -hmm. with engines, it's the same thing, right? Uh, you just make have to make sure that you have the easiest level of entry that you can to start working with an engine, to start learning things. And as you get more experience with that engine, you will start unlocking the secrets behind it and making something really amazing to the point that people will really actually doubt that you, you could make something so so incredible within that limitation, right? But that's exactly the kind of challenge that you have to overcome and you will overcome over experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're right. So, uh, talking about development and stuff, uh, how long has Evertry been, um, in development for? A little bit more than one year for Evertry, but like I said, before Evertry, there was a, a, a really interesting prototype that the deal was working on, and that prototype took, took six months. Mm -hmm. So if we say like from scratch to where we are now, it's like eighteen months. But ever try like as a game ever try is a little bit more than one year, like one year and one month. Okay. So uh, 
Because we talked about development. But one thing I want to talk about is game balancing. Because right. I kind of have a bone to pick with you. That tutorial. Am I just bad at the game? Am I not getting the game? Like, what's the balance? Is it supposed to be that hard? Right. Uh, I guess for for every game that you're trying to balance, you have to understand the your core audience to understand how you can figure out the, the difficulty level behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you cannot pick someone that really enjoy hyper casual games and never pick up Street Fighter and try to figure out how complex Street Fighter is because it's going to seem like that Street Fighter is the hardest game on earth. But for for someone that actually already played another fighting game, maybe Street Fighter doesn't seem that too hard, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the the player profile, what the experience that they are comfortable with, and the kind of experience that you are offering, and how that translates, right? So for every try, what I think is really fair about the game is that every time that you die, there is a lesson to be learned, right? So, and especially with especially when we talk about every try and how you can play in your own on pacing, so you don't have to play every try fast, right? You can like take each step and take as much time that you want because play, things are only going to move after you do. So if you really take your time when you're starting to figure the game out, then you can learn about uh, a lot about the behaviors of the enemies and how they move and how it's, how you can hit them before getting hit. So it's a lot about moving around things and figuring things out. And for us, the most important part of balancing effort right was making sure that the, the whole game can be beat just by using the, the melee basic attack and the dash uh, the dash command. So we are very confident that the game is really fair with that point because you don't actually need to get any ability or any modifier and you actually will be able to to finish the game. Okay, m m maybe I, I just need to get good. It's it, yeah, it, the beginning is the, the hardest. Yeah, I, I, I think like the hardest problem was the tutorial. Yeah, I'm not I'm not very happy with this. Like I, most of it I got it was like the 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 skill part when it asked you to use the skill I I, right. I had a hard time figuring how to, to use it on the enemy how to, to get it to line up on that particular tile tile right that's right. The, the the part that like really confused me so. Yeah, uh, I guess, of course, and the tutorial is, the, the role of the tutorial is teaching the player to make it, right? But that tutorial is something that I, I feel we are not doing the, a great job at teaching players mechanics. I actually have noticed that players learn more during normal gameplay than within the tutorial. So we will definitely work the tutorial, reward yeah. the tutorial. Yeah, and I, 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 and I get you, you trying to, to get them as soon as possible, so you have it. For the Kickstarter, so I I, I get yeah. that I, I get that so it's yeah. it, it's totally understandable if the like tutorial isn't as fine tuned as it could be I totally understand that. So. right thanks for for relating to me and as you said like there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of like written explanation and we know it it isn't that that good of an approach but like we had to do something for the demo and we really put a lot of effort into the mechanics itself and the content. So like okay, we ha we can make like a, a bad tutorial in a sense, but explain everything and make sure we tell players everything. And then if something doesn't work out, then they can figure out by themselves during gameplay. Or we can try not saying anything and maybe don't have any kind of of gauge of how players are actually dealing with the game. So we went with the one of two evils, right? Like let's explain everything, like even if that's in a bad manner. But if players can have any kind of information absorbed during the tutorial and then they learn the rest through gameplay, then that's enough for us to, to see them play and try to learn based on their gameplay. Yeah, it just... I just, just had like a hard time getting to the actual like gameplay because I was like stuck in the tutorial for so long. So. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no. Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll it's okay. Better. We'll do better. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I believe in you guys. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, but if that makes you feel better, uh, within our team, we have play times from six minutes flat beating the game to five hours. So there's a lot of room for different players to work with. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to be fair, I, I, I'm bad at games in general, 
So most <laughs> like me getting stuck at tutorial is pretty much the tradition by now. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've died in a tutorial and stuff. Like it, it, it gets like you're talking to the guy who was stuck in the boat in Fallout Three for a while. So <laughs> you you are were you were one of the most valuable persons to have within a focus group back oh, oh oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah I, I because get like you 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 have a really you can really get, give a little sense even if you say to yourself like ah oh, okay i'm i'm more towards the 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 less let's say the less this i don't know that the, the name the word in english but like i have the 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 least execution let's say like and that's really good information when we're balancing mm -hmm. things out because then because if you want this kind of players to actually enjoy your game too, you have to think about uh, having a mechanic that can appeal both to the, the high end, like really execution heavy plays stack and seven with their fifth player, and also to the guy that takes their time and has uh, has needs more time to figure things out. Okay. Because we are all players, right? There's mm -hmm. just different profiles, and yeah. every kind of players is so, so that, and weak so, and different things. So that like raises an interesting question then. So, when you're game balancing and targeting towards player, sh right. should your target be like everyone, or should it be a person of a particular like skill? Because I feel, feel like you can't please everyone. You can't target everyone. So it's about right. to just m m maybe to target a specific skill level. People like maybe just target the people who are really good, or maybe just the people who are really bad, or. or or should you really try and target towards everyone? Right, right. When, when we talk about target, that's a really strong word. Okay. That means that you can, as you said, you cannot target everyone. Mm -hmm. Because target is like something like this, like you shoot an arrow, right? So well, you have to think about... Uh, uh, the, uh, the well, mix. well, particularly your target audience, your target yeah, sure. de demographic. Yeah. yeah, so exactly. So when we talk about target audience, you have to think like a, like a real-time target, a real real life target. You have to focus on something that's going to give you the biggest return for your effort. And when I say return, I mean like going to have the biggest enjoyment in playing your game, mm -hmm. are going to give you like the best feedback that they can. It, so return like really varies on the situation, right? But when we make uh, a turn-based roguelike, we know that our target audience are, are the, the combination in some degree of two kind of player profiles. Players that like roguelites, mm -hmm. that generally like more challenging games and harder games, and players who like turn-based strategy, which is also a, a very challenging genre and really challenging difficulty. So when we combine both, in a sense, uh, we're already expecting our target audience to enjoy the difficulty level being higher. So we're not particularly concerned about it being challenging, but we try to make it in a way that like, we don't have very complex damage calculations because you either hitting the enemy for one or two damage. That's it. So this allows us to lower the entry level bar of every try. So we try to make sure that even players that don't go really far, they can exit the game and say, "I get it. It's not my dream, but I get it." Right? Yeah, yeah. We just don't want people to be like, "I I I couldn't figure it out. Like I don't know how everything works." Even for the players that don't enjoy this kind of genre, if they can play every try and say, "Yeah." I knew what I was supposed to do, but I just couldn't do it during yeah. gameplay. I would just like keep dying. Like, okay, we did our job. It's not yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. but because at yeah. the very least, it'll get people talking about your game, which is very important. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like, if if you, if we're making a game mechanic that doesn't leave people like really confused, and people that really enjoy that genre are are talking uh, in a good in a good nature about the game like yeah i enjoyed it. it was challenging but fair i this is the like the best compliment that i heard from from any kind of players like it was hard but fair this is exactly what i wanted i want people to die and feel that they can do better and they know how not to die that way the, the next time because if you die a hundred times then your 101 try is going to be better that's the, the thing that we want okay so, so to Kind of get into like our f f final section. Let's talk about Kickstarter and marketing, okay? Right. So, sure. So why Kickstarter? Why did you guys feel like you needed a Kickstarter, and why now? 
do you feel right. like it's so, too soon, too early? You know. Right. Uh, the Kickstarter, like Kickstarter, doesn't doesn't it cannot afford to be something done in a whim, right? We really planned ahead to have a Kickstarter because we are we are developing every tribe on our own, right? So the game mm-hmm. and the Neil and Gabriel, we're doing on our own, and we could make ever try into the uh, like an extended experience from our demo. But we wanted to do more. We wanted to have more bosses. We wanted to have more hazards. And we want to have like there's a lot of content planned that doesn't make sense budget wise if we cannot afford for it, right? And Kickstarter is a way for us to show people what we have been working on. And if they like it, they they, they can help help us actually put more content into the game. So Kickstarter is really playing two roles there. It is really a place that we can showcase our demo, and we made a demo specifically for Kickstarter, like to showcase this is the kind of experience that we have been working on, and people can really feel the the gameplay loop and experience and the combat and and the music and the art and try to expand that on their heads. Like, okay, there's going to be like 50 levels of this, but if we can actually manage to get to the those stretch goals, then we can really have more content. We have like special floors that we actually got through stretch goals. So we, we will be able to put like secret floors that people, that players can find that's going to have NPCs and tell more about the story behind the tower. We actually got more hazards to the game. We just recently made our $11,000 $11, stretch goal to introduce a, a whole new boss to ever try. So this is the kind of thing that really allows us to keep being responsible with development, like not overspending and not trying to have a game that's not never going to be finished because we are, are only making a game that that we have the budget and the time to, to do, right? So Kickstarter is like a, a great thermometer for us to know how much content we can actually put into the game. And the second role that the Kickstarter plays out is as a marketing tool, like it's a great way to showcase what we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lo, 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 lo. Trailer, people like, People discover new games through Kickstarter. We actually got the the games that we the projects that we love uh, tag really early on the platform, so it really helps us out. So it has been like an amazing experience for us, both in a sense of feedback and in a sense of like, like I always say, the game doesn't get funded. At least try to build an audience from the, sure. the Kickstarter. But like, make sure you list your social me media on the right. Kickstarter. Like for the love of Please, you know, you, you you think it'd be like common sense, so, but I've, I've I've seen people not like link to social media on the Pixar before at right. all. So, right. I, 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 and I think another good approach, uh, put like a link to your if you have one, like a Steam page. So at the very least, they can wish list it. So. So, so even if the Kickstarter fails, if if they do end up being able to actually like make the game make the game happen, people will like remember it and like check it out, you know, right, when exactly. it's actually released. So I think that's another approach. But I want you to sell your game a bit more. Why should people back the game on Kickstarter? Why? Right. So first first reason already. Okay. If you haven't played the demo yet, then play the demo. That's mm-hmm. going to give like you 100 reasons. But actually, first reason, right? The game's already back. So advertise is already going to get to the market. So every little bit of, of more backing that we can, we have for the game, is actually just make the game better. Mm-hmm. So we can it, we can have like the vanilla version of Evertrite in the market. We can have like the premium version of Evertrite getting to the market. But we can have like the, the amazing super duper version of Evertrite mm. and the Return of the, the Jedi and Knuckles version of Evertrite to reach the market for multiple platforms. We have the, the 18, 18K stretch goal for Switch and PlayStation 4 and 5 and Xbox Series X and everything. So the more the more support that we can have with the, with the, the Kickstarter and the more funding that we can have is just making a game that's already something that's going to happen even better. So please consider back in the, the game on Kickstarter if it is your, your jam. And it is also like a letter of love from us to pixel art that we, we, we I feel we, we did a lot, put a lot of effort into making sure that the pixel art. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I love like the art direction and like the character designs and stuff like really well done. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. The, the guys gonna be really pleased hearing about this. Yeah. So it's it's an aesthetic that we did put a lot of work into. We're not never going to stop working until the game is done. So I'll make sure to post more updates on the Kickstarter mm -hmm. campaign. We talked about balancing and we talk about design on the Kickstarter campaign page. We're going to make uh, that's a little bit of spoiler, but we we just revealed our next stretch goals, not next next stretch goal for smoother animations. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a taste of new animations that we want to put in Everdrive, making everything looks more amazing, more fluid, and more exciting. And and I, I I guess it's also a good uh, good showcase for people to that actually enjoy strategy games like Into the Bridge. If you like Into the Bridge, play our them. I think there's something for you guys. But it's a way for us to keep the the turn-based strategy genre going. And we have a really good indie following behind it. That's a lot of great projects with turn-based combat. And we pull a little a little bit of our own twist on it with the real-time kinda way to, to play it out so please uh try it out try our demo see what you think because i think we actually end up with something really unique and we are really proud of the, the amount of work love and fun that you you might enjoy playing ever right i hope i did a good job now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, you did an awesome so uh since we're talking about kickstarts like how important do you think marketing is for a, for a game, should like people even bother marketing? Is it like super important? It's super important. Oh yeah. Like, if you're talking about having a commercial game, you cannot dismiss marketing. Like even on earlier stages. Yeah. Uh, there's a saying in production that marketing is like half of your budget for the whole game. Oh yeah. So if you have any kind of aspiration of doing something commercial, commercially viable, you have to know your your marketing strategy. Of course. No one is a master of every subject. So if you can talk with people that really understand marketing, if you have a friend that knows marketing, read a lot of post-mortem from other other titles. Like there's a lot of GDC speakers on GDC Vault that you can li listen to. There's a lot of articles on Gamma Sutra yeah. to read about games. So yeah. you can learn a lot about marketing. Yeah, and like uh, read some books or like look at look at what other people doing like like break apart like analyze like try and take about like why did this marketing work you know right. that kind of thing right exactly and it, the easiest the easiest thing when we're talking about should i make a kickstarter page should i do this should i do that look projects that went wrong with each strategy like there's a lot of post-mortems of developers talking about the, the wrong turns that they make because you cannot be sure about the, the mistakes that you're going to make, but you have to be sure you're not going to make any mistakes that people already have yeah. made. And, 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 and you're, you're making sure that like half of the mistakes you won't commit. And do you do realize, even though it may seem like it, Kickstarter isn't a charity. So you, ne right. you need to be responsible and, sure. and stuff. You shouldn't just do a Kickstarter just to milk people dry. You know, you... you yeah. Don't get too ambitious. Like, make sure you can f fulfill. You know, don't don't like take advantage of people's kindness. You know, I because I, like I feel like lately Kickstarter's gotten a bad rap. You know, people there's like a lot of shady Kickstarters out there. I I I I I've seen a couple ones and, and it, it it upsets me because it makes people who have legitimate good Kickstarters it make them look bad and. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's worse to like it's better to fail at a Kickstarter campaign that you get funded and don't have the means to to deliver because then you just rob people, right? You have to be responsible. You have to do it in a sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared. So the same the same advice I give for people for life, which is like have a plan, like think ahead of what you're going to do and how much is the risk. The same thing for game, game development. If you want to consider any kind of strategy or any kind of move, have a plan. Be sure you can deliver that. Never overcommit to something that you're not sure you can deliver. Because like, if you say, yes, we're going to have like a real-life statue of the Fallen Warrior for our back and we're going to deliver worldwide, then you're screwed. Because if you have like a, a team like ours of six people, you're never going to get that, you're never going to get that made. 
So work yeah. in, a, in a way that makes sense and promise something that you can actually deliver and try yeah. to be as yeah. transparent as it, you can with your package. Yeah, I think it's best to have few uh, rewards and stuff that you can deliver than having super ambitious rewards that you can't deliver, right. you know? Yeah, exactly. For Evertrade is, yeah. is a great example. We, we don't have any kind of like physical goods as a, as, as a delivery system because we are doing a global pandemic where the yeah. bears are crazy. We knew it was going to be like hell to try to figure everything out. So we make sure like what kind of digital reward we can give people that, that feels meaningful yeah. and we can actually deliver. So we offer to create the, the, the backers' own design for the Falling Warrior to, so they can play ooh. as their own like, ooh, say, ooh, warrior. Ooh, ooh, on. Ooh. How much is that one? I guess it, that's the the most expensive one. I oh, okay. I believe it, it's five hundred dollars for you to have your own main character within the game. But we have like two okay, more. Okay, never like mind. Having an NPC uh, and having... I, 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 I'm not rich. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I get like I've I've always thought about doing one of those rewards, but when does it stop? You, you know, my, my right. first five hundred dollars on the Kickstarter. When does it stop? So, so I, I try to not go too crazy with Kickstarter because I, I don't know when to stop, you know? Right, right. I guess for most people, the Kickstarter is a great way for you to pre-order games. For instance, Evertrade is already funded. So yeah, yeah you, like... Evertrade, you're actually do you think Kickstarter, right Kickstarter should be treated as a pre-order system? Because I've had, I've had conversations with like, there's people who... Who think it, 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 it really shouldn't be a uh, pre order it, it should be like people who like really need the funding, you know? Right, yeah, I don't think Kickstarter uh, 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 should be treated as, as pre order. Because we've seen, but... we've seen like larger AAA companies start to use Kickstarter stuff like Kickstarters, so. Yeah, it, in the end, it is a tool, right? It, it's not what it was created for. But sometimes in history, people use tools what for what they think it's best, not exactly for what it was created for, right? So I guess Kickstarter should has been playing a, a big role in funding for small teams like ourselves, and I think that's the most important part of Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. I also believe that for even for bigger bigger studios that because sometimes. Bigger studios are not necessarily swimming in cash, right? They, yeah, they we, 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 think, right. we think they are, but th th that isn't always yeah. the case. We don't... It's, it's really we, expensive for them to, to make games, right? Yeah. So sometimes within their team, they have a project that they want to make, but it doesn't fit the budget. So Kickstarter is not necessarily the way for them to get funding, but it's, it's the way for them to get the validation. Because there's no clear message for any kind of company that people want your product. Then when they pay ahead of time, like yes, take my money. I really want mm -hmm. to make to see that made. So I, I know how Kickstarter can play a big impact on bigger bigger companies as well. Mm -hmm. And for us, of course, it's more like a funding kind of funding and showcasing situation. But mm -hmm. I know how much it can be validation for bigger studios as well. But the thing is, you, you should interpret Kickstarter, you know, in a way that's best for the players. So for players that are backing on a, a project that's already funded. Sure, three is like uh, a pre-order, especially if it has a demo, so you can really try out before mm -hmm. what kind of spirit you're going to have. But it is also a way for you to support, just support people that you enjoy to see their work or enjoy projects that you, you like to see that you have life, independently of how big or small the project is. Kickstarter is about support. Yeah, 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 yeah. I totally agree on a lot of that. So, so, we were talking about tools and stuff. What do you think is the best marketing tool? Is it Discord? Is it Twitter? Facebook? Is it getting a giant billboard? I don't know if those are effective anymore. Like, <laughs> those can be pricey, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and the return, return of investment of, of yeah. the works, especially for games I. I don't well, like I, 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 I mean, I see them all the time, but like, do, do people really pay attention to them? I I, I wonder. I, I I don't think so. I think people just ignore them. Really, there's a there's a thing in marketing called frequency. Sometimes it's not the billboard that's going to make you call the service or buy the product, but the fact that 
you already you saw the billboard at that one time that when you see the commercial it's not yeah yeah boring for you right it's like oh yeah i remember this, this thing i don't i don't know where i saw that before but yeah i know it feels it, you feel more confident with someone that you already saw before right yes so what, what do you think is the best marketing platform or tool right uh i'm, I'm not a, a marketing expert so if anyone wants to, to take my advice and run with it please don't think, <laughs> like, follow my previous advice have a plan like don't listen to, to me like blindly so research for yourself but for me i guess social media is the biggest the biggest drive and maybe that's because we are small yeah. But when we talk well, about we, we do live in, an, in like a day and age where like social media has become our life, like it's integrated right. in our life. Like we can't, we really can't live without social media, to right. some degree. Right. right, because it's not, it's not social media anymore. It's society, right? Yeah. Because if we communicate through social media, it's already it's not something that that's that. that orbitate society it's already inside of us right and especially for us we are a small team mm -hmm. so if we can reach like a youtuber a streamer doesn't matter <coughs> how how it is, that's the way for us to get eyeballs and get people talking about our project and that's the biggest return of investment that we can because when we talk with through social media people that reach us that they that we can reply to and vice versa is actually people that are invested either on us or in the game then the, the, the coverage and the showcase is much more transparent and much more like truthful of what the experience that we want to showcase. Uh, do you have anything else to, to add to that? But I, I guess, again, if you're looking for the, the best marketing like channel let's say, or media to showcase your work, uh, try everything out that uh, that's uh, That's like pretty much the answer like i don't think one platform outweighs another and why would you only want to stick with one platform like you use everything to your disposal like why why would you give yourself that handicap that disadvantage like you right. know use them all maybe stay away from tiktok but other than that one you know right right try to try to figure out where your audience is and mm -hmm. then invest. Yeah, and, and, and like joins your Discord server. Yeah, but yeah. And, and, and and I'm sorry. And figure out like the strength of that particular like platform. Like figure out what kind of content you can can uh put on Twitter to promote your game, and what kind of content are you putting on Instagram or Facebook? Because what works on Twitter may not work on like Instagram, you know, exactly. play exactly. play to those strengths, and you know, right. you you really got that first by and another, another uh, platform people may not be taking enough advantage is YouTube. Like I think right. YouTube can provide the best like game marketing in my personal opinion. Right, right, for sure. Yeah, I don't know why why people don't play YouTube. Like it's the social media that I consume the most, so maybe mm -hmm. I'm biased because I love YouTube. There's a right. lot of content creators that do amazing job. Yeah. And, and for instance, and, and, the, the Crystal Chronicle remake which just went out. And I, I really enjoyed the game. So the oh, first oh, thing that I did is that's... like search YouTube about people playing Crystal Chronicles remake because I want to see the experience, right? Did that like j j j just come out? Yes, I guess yeah, come yeah, out yeah, like yeah. last week or the week before. Because I saw a friend playing it. I, 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 I need to like pick that, but maybe after I'm done with Marvel's Avengers, because I've been I, I've been playing that. Like I'm actually liking it. Oh great! Yeah, I, I saw a little bit of gameplay today, and I, but, I, I don't think it's my it's my cup of tea. But, but, but the cinematics are pretty fun. Oh, oh yeah, but but like it, it makes me man. I I just want a Hulk game after this. <laughs> right. Uh, anyways, back to what you're saying about YouTube. Right. So yeah, I completely agree. Like, for, we we already used as a gaming community. Let's say mm -hmm. we can say that because there's so many different profiles. But we're already used to consuming like let's play and reviews and video essays and any kind of video editing with video games. So that's like when we talk about subjects, we know gaming is the biggest subject in YouTube. So why don't we 
like reading tests on it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 but uh, so I, I do, do, do kind of want to say when I say using YouTube as marketing, I, I don't mean just put your trailers on there. I feel like you have to do more than just putting a trailer because no one knows who you are. Like, they're right. not going to be searching for your trailer. So you you have to have other content so to go check your trailer out. So I think the best content, in my personal opinion, for a game developer, is doing devlogs. Like, if you can do a well-produced, like, a devlog that, that like, really flows and people can gravitate towards, especially because, like, YouTube and content creation, it's all about your personalities. So if you could bring that right. person personality and connect with your audience, they're gonna gravitate towards your game. Right, right. I guess the main challenge behind that would be that there's there's a different skill set for you to make, like, to be charismatic and being a good entertainer. Mm -hmm. Even if you're talking about, like, the coding that you're writing, you have to be someone that people would want to listen well, to. I, I, and maybe I, I, there's a different I, I, skill I, I, set. I, 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 I mean, but I completely I'm, agree with you. It would be I, really good. I, I, I'm not like talking about like streaming your game development or anything. Like I'm talking about like talking about the development of your games. Sure. So, so like maybe one episode can be about like the origins of your game and you do a voiceover and talk about how you're talking about that and maybe another episode will be about art or like let's say you have like an important update and cool features make like a devlog about that you know you, you, you right. don't you don't have to upload one like every week but doing it weekly does help you know but right yeah that's a very interesting perspective um yeah now you talked about it uh the the biggest uh, like the most well received update that we went that we made for our Kickstarter campaign was the one that we talked about design, like the, the like the what goes behind designing the combat they never tried, and people really enjoy that. So I can see how making like a video explaining the design behind never tried and doing a devlog on that would be potentially yeah. a like the example I always give, and he's a friend of mine. Uh, I have you heard of the game Swords and Magic? Swords and Magic. The the name. Is, the name rings a bell, but uh, I, I can't. Uh, uh, it, it's it's made by Kindred Games. So he he started uh, just doing game development streams on Twitch, but eventually he started doing devlogs on YouTube, and his like devlogs do really well. Like it, so when he launched his Kickstarter, it helped. Like right. yeah, it, exactly because we're in a hella community, right? Yeah, yeah, like really help blow his kick. So to the point, like it was the future like project on kickstarter right so, so that's pretty impressive and that helped a lot and like it's a game launch today like a majority of his success was like building a community and i think building a community is really important when it comes to like game marketing right right yeah i completely agree i get. i guess building a community is one of the greatest tools that you you can have the question is how if you have yeah exactly like you have the tools to make a, a great community like are you you have the, the right person with the right yeah. set there you have the time to do that is and that I, I i i think it always kind of comes down to what kind of community do you want yeah that's do, do, do you want a community of game developers gamers do, do you want like a community where you uh play your game t together and talk about other games or do you want more like corporate business kind of feel to your community right you, you know what kind of community do you want i i think that's what you probably need to figure out first in your marketing so, right right so did you have any other marketing advice for people i i actually don't feel too too confident talking about marketing so much <laughs> because I, I i'm learning myself right because yeah. i think that's a big step for us and we're trying our best and we're trying to yeah. Hey, learn as much I, I, as we can before it, right? But I'm I'm I, I'm still learning about marketing, social media, content creation. It's all a learning experience. Like in life, no one knows what they're doing. Even like experts are probably still learning stuff here and there. Right. So, so you're gonna be learning your whole life. So right, right. I guess the only advice that I I have is try things out in in a way that makes sense for you. So if 
if you really want to spend money like advertising social media like if you have 100 dollars then put like five dollars in each platform and see how they behave like try to learn how things by experience because there's a lot of content like we said between books and and speakers through gdc board and, and blogs and you can learn a, a lot about marketing theory and its strategies mm -hmm. but try for yourself because that's the best way for you to learn how things work for you and then try to keep combining those things and iterating and try to learn as much as you can until you actually can hire a, like expert marketing person because that would be great oh right? the, uh, actually yeah. that's, that's something i didn't ask do you think it's better for like an indie developer to run their social media themselves or, or to get someone uh better is a it's a hard thing to to, to answer because one could say that if the developer itself answers and replies everyone through social media, then, then the answer is like always from the source in mm -hmm. a way. But I would prefer to have the development team 100% focused on development and 100% capable of doing development and having one guy from the team that's 100% capable of doing social media, doing social media, because then the social media experience should be better because the guy knows what he's doing. He's making like funny gifs and memes maybe he making good content. He knows what people want to see. Mm -hmm. It's not like just a a, a a mask that developers are using, like to to try to intermediate between development and the players, right? It's someone that actually also cares about the game, that's also trying to do his best to think his his toolbox to to help people yeah. interact with. Yeah, I, so I, I'd I, rather have someone focusing on that. Yeah. So, are you ready for the final question of of this yes. podcast? So. Yes. What is the most important thing you've learned through your whole game development journey? What's the most important thing you've learned? I, I would. Well, <laughs> I I thought I was prepared. That's, that's Take your time. Take yeah. Your time. Okay. Uh, I would say that it was something that I thought I knew, but I keep learning the same lesson, which is what you do is just as good as what players feel from what you do so you can like spend 100 years studying the, the combat mechanics of your game if players play that and they say to you like the most fun part of your game is watering the plants then go for watering the plants like, it doesn't matter if you spend like 100 years studying combat design because you have to you have to chase where the fun is in your game and people, people, not people, sorry, players will tell you where the fun is. Even if they don't speak like directly to you, when you see them play, you will notice where the play is. And sometimes where the play is, is not where you thought it was. And believe me, the players are right. They know where the fun is. They don't know where the fun is. So I thought I knew that because I have worked with focus groups and testing before. Mm -hmm. But players keep me proving wrong about things that I thought I knew. So yeah, that would be the... I think the, the most important thing that I learned chase the fun and look and to find the fun look for players yeah I think that that's an important value lesson well I, 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 I want to like thank you for joining me so where can people find you uh, right anything you want to talk about your game what, what can they check your game Kickstarter, discord all that stuff right uh, so first of all thanks for having me Nano. it mm -hmm. was a blast yeah uh, I thought it would be fun. It was much fun, much more fun than I thought. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can follow us on Twitter at Everdrive Game, capital E, capital G. Uh, we do have a Discord server that we actually have a, like a, a Twitter post every day, updating like with a, a new invite for people to join us. Mm -hmm. So check out our Twitter profile. You'll find our Discord channel. Check out our Kickstarter, please. We have the campaign going out until the twenty second of November. Until then, like we have. I guess 14 days still left to go. So play the demo, try to download it. Uh, yeah. If you like it, please consider yeah. backing us because that makes. I mean, the if the, if the Kickstarter is up, uh, still up by the time that this goes up, so you know. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So if it's up, yeah. then please uh, try uh, consider supporting us on Kickstarter. We're also going to be uh, available during Tokyo Game Show in I guess late September 22nd, 24th, 23rd as well. And of course, don't forget to follow Nano Indie Cafe on Twitter and follow him 
on on Twitch and subscribe to him on Twitch. <laughs> you you, you, you pretty much doing my job for me. Thank you, man. And give him as much support as you can because he's doing an amazing job trying to give us a hand from the indie community. Mm -hmm. And he's he's a great guy. Like I met him like the other week, and already spent more time talking to him like than most of of programmers that I met in my life. He's just so, such an awesome guy. Please Stop, support. you're making me blush here, man. Thank you for, for watching. I, I hope you enjoyed this interview. You can check out our get guest links in the description below. You can also check out links for the Nano Dink Indie Cafe and some of our other channels and brands also in the description below. If, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, like the video, and maybe even ring that bell. For all your platforms, subscribe. Leave a review rating, maybe even download the, the episodes so you can listen on the go, and we will see you guys next time.